Our scripture today is from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I want to share with you today around the theme, how to be a more loving person. The German philosopher Schopenhauer gave an illustration of the predicament that all of us face when we seek to become a more loving person. He noticed that porcupines sought to huddle together on a cold and wintry day. But they faced this insurmountable problem that the closer they got together, the more their quills pricked one another. But then when they parted because they couldn't take each other, they all suffered from the cold by being alone. How can we be together and not be porcupines? How can we be more loving people? Well, last week we made a start at beginning to answer that question. Two strategic points were made last week about 1 Corinthians 13 in reference to being a more loving person. One is that our love must be a Christian love rather than simply a romantic love. Thank God for romantic love. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. And uh, it's what God ordains to get a relationship going that produces marriage. But there is something far deeper than a romantic love. It's Christian love. A love that is anchored in the will and not in the feelings. A love that's based upon commitment rather than the attractiveness of another person. A love that draws upon the grace of God rather than simply what another person does to us by way of response. So beginning to love is understanding something about what Christian love is. And secondly, last week we said love must be our chief priority. 1 Corinthians 13 really talks to us about the priority of love, the practice of love, and the permanence of love. And verses 1 through 3 are about the priority of love. And verses 4 through 7 about the practice of love. Have you ever noticed if you've been in a large hotel and gotten on the elevators, you go to the upper floors that there is no button for the 13th floor. They don't have a 13th floor button in most large hotels. Evidently, people are superstitious and don't want to stay on the 13th floor, so it always jumps from 12 to 14. Could it be possible that some of us may be living the Christian life without the 13th floor of the Corinthian letter? 1 Corinthians 13, where the love is. Basically, the problem with the Corinthian church was they were jumping from floor 12 to floor 14, all the gifts, and had missed the 13th floor, love, which is the center floor and, and, and the floor from which the gifts can only flow accurately and, and goodly. Now, in regard to making love our chief priority, we're not talking about making ourselves as love objects the chief priority. I must be loved. I must find somebody who will love me. We're not talking about being loved, we're talking about being lovers. And I really wrestled even today with a temptation to call this message how to be better lovers. But I thought that was a little bit too sloganish. I wait to be loved and love, then life is out of my control because I must wait then for the right circumstances to break. That's why romantic love is, is doesn't have the depth of Christian love because romantic love must wait to be loved. But Christian love doesn't wait to be loved. Christian love makes a decision to love. You may have played the game when you were younger, I know I did, of taking a straw and doing the love me, love me not, love me, love me not. Have any of you done this in here? George, you shook your head no. I find that you never did that. That is amazing, as loving a person as you are. Well, you know what George does all the time. He takes the straw and he goes, love you, love you, love you, love you, love you. See, we're not waiting to be loved. We're taking the straw and turning it another way. The practice of love. How to be more loving continues as we approach these verses today. Paul gives us two things to embrace. Two positive things. Actually, in in talking about the practice of love, he tells us what love is, and then he 
takes more time telling us what love is not. Uh, and I think that's important because sometimes in order to find what something is, you must say a whole lot about what it's not. And when you get all done, you say, love is everything else but what it is not. Love is. Love is patience and kindness. These are the passive and active sides of love. Patience is the passive side. It is the word which the King James translation calls long-suffering. In the Greek, it is makrothumos, meaning long anger, or to more appropriately put it, it is used to describe a person who has put a great deal of distance between himself and anger. It is being away from, a long way from anger. It's the opposite of a short-fused person. It is a word that in the New Testament, when it's used, always describes patience with people and not with circumstances. It's one thing to be patient with circumstances, another thing to be patient with people. So it's a people word. And it describes a choice to on occasion suffer. I think it's so striking that Paul would start out to describe love by describing it from a passive sense. Not as something you do, but something that you receive and take into your spirit. It is a way of uh, response. Because Paul knows, as we all know, when we live life any degree of time at all, that life has its rocky moments and its really bumps and shakes. And that people jar us. People in the closest relationships with us. Our greatest hurts are within family. These moments come and how we in those moments respond to people is critical. And what the Apostle is saying, first of all, love as a response on the passive side is receiving. It is, it is responding with long-suffering. I think I can perhaps put it better by this little illustration, which is one of my favorites, of the young minister who, or the young man who, who went to the minister who had married him a few months before complaining about his marriage and saying how much his wife was different from the girl he thought he was marrying. And uh, the minister said, but remember, you took her for better or for worse. To which the young man responded, yes, but she's worse than I took her for. And, and that's exactly where the word patience comes in, when someone is worse than we took them for. The word is used in the Gospels of Jesus' story of the two debtors, Matthew 18, verses 26 and 29, where they begged, be patient with me. The debt was due. They recognized that, but be patient. A historical illustration of patience I ran across this week. Uh, remember Secretary of War Stanton who served under Abraham Lincoln. seems that before Lincoln was ever elected president, Stanton had a great hate affair with Lincoln. He called Lincoln a low, cunning clown and the original gorilla. Makes you think you were watching a political convention, doesn't it? He said that a zookeeper of the time who was off in Africa, trying to capture a gorilla was a fool to go to Africa to try to capture a gorilla when he could so easily find one in Springfield, Illinois. When Lincoln became president, he made Stanton Secretary of War. <laughs> he said that Stanton was the best man for the job and that's why he got the appointment. The night that Lincoln was shot in Ford's Theater and lay in the house across from Ford's Theater, it was Stanton who kept the all-night vigil over Lincoln and who when Lincoln closed his eyes and breathed his last, it was Stanton who said, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. Lincoln won him through his patience. Love is long-suffering. On the active side, love is kindness. It's a, something we do for other people. It's an ongoing Outward action. Energy coming from us. T kindness is a difficult word perhaps to get a hold of. It's something that when you see it, you know it. When you see a person who demonstrates it, you recognize it. Jesus says there are some very elemental ways to become a kind person. It's, doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily innate at all. It can be a learned behavior. One of the ways is through the speech gate to bless those who curse you. And the word bless is the word eulogeo in the Greek, which means to speak well of those who curse you. One of the ways of demonstrating kindness is begin to get a hold of our language that we direct toward people and then to accompany that with our deeds, do good, 
And also beyond that to develop a kind of responsiveness of going the second mile when we are when we are put upon and even beyond that to in our own human spirits pray uh, to show kindness toward those who may not be kind toward us. To be kind. So Paul says be patient, be kind. Henry Drummond in his classic little book on 1 Corinthians 13 called The Greatest Thing in the World says this about kindness. I shall pass through this world but once. Any good thing, therefore, that I can do or any kindness that I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer it or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. Paul goes on in this passage to tell us what to reject. And he gives us eight qualities to reject. For to be more loving persons, here are some things we are not to be. The first off is jealousy. Love is not jealous. Now jealousy, as you know, has a good and a bad side. It is good when it cares about another people. I care about relationships, therefore I care about their integrity. When someone might want to come along and destroy the relationship, I care enough about the relationship to be jealous. But on the other hand, jealousy has its bad side when it cares only about ourselves. There may be marriages represented here today with tremendous amounts of jealousy and envy. Jealous because the football season is coming back soon. Jealous because of a mother-in-law. Jealous because of the priority of work. Jealous because of the suspicion or even the reality of an extramarital affair. Jealous. Love is not jealous. I think of a person who shared this story with me and gave me permission to share it with others, a personal friend of ours. She and her husband were often together socially with another couple their age, and she learned that her husband was having an affair with the other woman. And a dinner date was on their calendar to get together with this couple for the dinner just for the two couples. The other woman did not know that this Christian wife had found out about the affair. As the dinner date approached, this friend of ours who had been wronged was praying that somehow God would give her the grace and the ability and the strength that she needed to face that other person at the dinner table. She prayed that the Lord, in addition to that, would help her to love this other woman. The dinner came and went. Many times after the dinner, the two couples continued to be thrown together socially. Always this friend of ours praying that the Lord would use her to love everybody involved. Time went by. The other woman moved away and sometime later returned. While she was gone, she came to know the Lord. And the two women met again and talked about what had happened. The one who had had the affair said, At the time, I knew what you were doing. You were reaching out to me with the love of Christ. I don't know that there's many people that have the strength naturally to bring off that kind of love. And I told that to the person who shared that story with me. And her response was, I don't have the strength. It was Christ loving through me. Was she concerned about her marriage? Yes. On the good side, she manifested jealousy. She was concerned about that relationship and its integrity. But she didn't allow jealousy to eat her up in the process and she did not allow jealousy to eat up another person in the process. Somehow to develop a reaction that says, not here what I'm living and what I'm feeling, but what is Christ living and feeling within me? If Christ lives in me, then He must react as well. He must feel a certain way about what is happening to me. How does He feel? Can I stay long enough and silent enough before Him that I can say to Him, Jesus, what are you thinking right now? What are you saying right now? What would you say to everybody involved in this situation? What's in your heart? We might want to say, if we are jealous, this person is hurting me and I want to hurt him back. But Christ is saying, so often, this person is hurting because they are hurting. This person is not loving because they have not been loved. So, love them in my name. Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. King James has vaunteth not itself. Rather difficult to get a hold of. Boastful is better. 
Moffat translation says, love makes no parade. Boastfulness can describe a person who talks about themselves rather than listening to others. It's a person who's caught up with an exaggerated idea of their own self-importance. It can also be used to describe a person who does deeds of love in order to manipulate other people. Remember I did that for you? No, you need to do that for me. Boastful. Arrogance. A third thing to reject. Arrogance is the word puffing up. And Paul uses it ad infinitum in the Corinthian letter. He's always talking about you, but you are puffed up. It is different from arrogance or puffing up is different from Healthy self-esteem, which says, before God and before others and before myself, I'm a worthwhile person made in Christ's image. It is a kind of self-esteem that proceeds from arrogance or pride and that because it depends upon arrogance and pride, needs to put other people down. The arrogant person never feels comfortable with being on the same level with other people. He's got to somehow put them down in order to establish his or her own importance. Arrogance. It reflects disdain, a lack of respect, and often it's manifested by cutting sarcasm. Fourth, rudeness. King James says, doth not behave itself unseemly. Oh, that is such an elegant phrase. Is not rude. Love, in other words, love has manners. <laughs> love has manners. We were playing a family game this week, and George and I were partners against the girls in our family. Whenever we play the girls, we want to beat them. I don't ever play a game that I don't intend to win. And uh, George was just learning this game and he made a couple critical mistakes that could have cost us the game. And I was just amazed at what came out of me in terms of putting pressure on him to learn that game quick. (laughs) In fact, I got downright rude to him about his mistakes were costing us the game and he better start watching what was going on. And then I had to prepare this sermon. But I discovered something. You and I are not generally rude to the general public. I don't come here on Sunday mornings and insult you as you pass by. I only insult people that I trust, that know me well enough that I feel safe to insult them. (laughs) And it's these very people, and you you know the people that are around you that this happens to. Love is not rude. Love has good manners. Even in family. Poor little boy. Well, we eventually won the game. <laughs> love is not selfish. King James has love seeketh not its own. Again, an elegant phrase. Love is not selfish. Would you like to take a little test to determine whether or not you're a selfish person? Well, I'll give it to you real quick. There are twelve questions. There are only ten in the bulletin, but there are actually twelve. These are simple. You can answer yes or no. And let me just ask you to think about these as we look at them. One, do I get upset when things don't go my way? Not just once in a while, but I mean rather consistently. Do I get upset when things don't go my way? Two, would the people who know me best say that I am a person who is difficult to live with? Three, do I dislike to spend money generously on others? Now, this doesn't ask if you have money. It just ask if you delight, dislike to spend it generously on others. Fourth, am I a poor loser? Five, do I get angry with God when life doesn't go the way I think it should? Hey, God, it's me, your kid down here. You're supposed to be taking care of me. Where are you? Does it bother me to be inconvenienced or put upon? But I've got my agenda laid out. Do I persist? Another question. Do I persist in doing anything which I know irritates or hurts someone close to me? Do I persist in doing something which I know irritates or hurts someone close to me? Eight. Am I set in my ways and nothing is going to change me now? (laughs) Nine, do I get upset when I don't get my share of the pie? Any kind of pie. 
10 is getting my share of the pie more important to me than being a disciple of Jesus? Am I going to insist that this has got to be for me whether the Lord wants it or not? 11. Do I have a tendency to become defensive or argumentative when I am criticized? And 12. Am I a chronic complainer or a grouser? Say, where in the world, Pastor, did you get a test like that? I made it up. <laughs> I took the times I'm selfish in my own life and I just made questions out of them. And then I looked at Jesus to answer these questions. How would he answer them? Is he a poor loser? Does he get angry at God when things don't go his way? Does he get upset when he doesn't get his fair share of the pie? Does he persist, persist in doing something which he knows would irritate or hurt us? Does it bother him to be inconvenienced or put upon? Wow. Wow. Someone has written of Jesus. If you want a fitting accusation to write on the cross of Jesus, this is the only one he loved too much. Love is not selfish. Love is not irritable. By the way, I hope you all scored no's on that test. Eight, nine, or ten no's is probably really an unselfish person. Uh, eight, nine, or ten yeses probably suggests some arena for activity. This sermon is for you. Love is not irritable. Irritable means not easily angered. My son, George Paul, whom I referred to a moment ago, for those of you who don't know him, he's 11, he said to me recently, Dad, he said, I don't understand how it is that you said that nobody could ever make you mad, that you can only make yourself mad. And I said, well... It's because I cannot control my circumstances. The only thing I can control is my response to them. And that's why nobody can really make me mad. I'm the only one that can allow me to be mad. Cecil Osborne talks about the gunny sack technique of irritability. It's a gunny sacker is one who carries an invisible bag over his shoulder and puts in tidbits of anger hour by hour, day by day. When the sack is filled, and someone irritates him or her however slightly, he or she erupts with unreasoning anger and dumps the whole gunny sack on the victim. Love is not irritable. Love is not unforgiving. It keeps no record of wrongs. The word uh, keep no record of wrongs in the Greek is a word that is used to describe an activity of accountants who enter something into a ledger and once the debit or the credits entered into the ledger, there it stays as a permanent record. Love is not keeping a record of wrongs. It is not saying, but you did that to me so and so years ago or days ago. It keeps no record of wrongs. Frank Laubach reminds us that it's often easier to love God than it is people. <laughs> that Jesus... The God we see in Jesus is the most lovable being in the universe, but people are often so very contemptible. Unforgiving. Keep no record of wrongs. And eighth, Paul says, love is not an unempathetic or unsympathetic heart. That is, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Rejoices with the truth. Not the truth of two plus two equals four but the truth that looks at what is good and pure and beautiful and wonderful, things that are lovely to consider. It, this kind of an attitude of looking on the truthfulness uh, side is the opposite of gloating in another person's misfortune. Now, eight negatives, Paul says, what love is not. And to the degree that negatives may be present in our lives, to that degree our love is weakened and dissipated. Obviously, to all the couples in here today, this has special relationships. To all of us husbands, this chapter has special meaning for the Lord has told us through the Apostle Paul that we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. I came across an astounding poem this week by Ruth Calkins Harms. Ruth Harms Calkins. A little book on marriage poems. What she said about her hus husband absolutely nailed me to the wall because I realized that my wife could not say yet the same thing about me. And it's a tremendous demonstration of what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 13. 
something that I think all of us as husbands, if I could just share a word with you, could really aim for in our lives. Thank you for the things you never do, she writes to her husband. You never embarrass me with crude, uncouth remarks. You never criticize me in the presence of others. You never downgrade my personal achievements. You never compete with me. You never compare me unfavorably with other wives. You never make me feel unnecessary or unneeded. You never hide behind a newspaper while we're eating together. You never refuse to hear me out in a controversial discussion. You never remind me of past mistakes. You never rule me with an iron rod. You never treat my parents unkindly. You never degrade me. You never betray me. You never deluge me with I told you so's. You never go to sleep without kissing me goodnight. Hmm. Well, all the wives said... (laughs) I'll tell you it is wonderful to get a perspective on our life as the Lord really wants us to look at our life somehow to be lifted out of the humdrum and see again what in Christ we're called to be well what to pursue in respect to love Verse 7, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I forgot what the King James says at the start of verse 7. Some of you have the King James Bible open. What's the word in the King James? Love beareth all things. The Greek word that's employed here can mean one of two things. It can mean love bears all things, that is, it carries them, or it can mean love covers all things. Either rendering is appropriate. The same verb is used in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Love covers a multitude of sins. In other words, true love does not scatter around the unpleasant. It doesn't remind other people of the failings of the person loved. It hides, it covers what is unpleasant. It protects. But it also carries. Love carries all things. Love carries burdens. Love carries possibilities. Love carries a brother, as you know in the little story that's told of the little boy carrying his brother on his back. And someone said, isn't that that load on your back heavy? And, And the response is, no, he's not heavy, he's my brother. Love carries all things. Love believes all things. Now this does not mean that Christian love as a belief is naive. It doesn't mean that you believe everything it's told you. Jesus didn't say to Judas when he met him in the garden, Love believes all things, Judas. What a beautiful kiss you've just given me. I'm so glad to know you've changed your mind. Love is not naive. Love isn't fooled by the rogues. Love doesn't believe that black is white. But in doubtful cases, love will give the benefit of the doubt. Love does not wait for someone to prove themselves. Jesus does not say to the woman taken in adultery, Now I'm not sure I can ever trust you or believe in you enough, I need to put you on conditional probation and 12 months later we'll come back and see if you're worthy of my love. Love doesn't put people on probation. Love believes. Love hopes. Love doesn't give up on people. The early Christians said to the people who crucified Jesus, you did it in ignorance. They're willing to have hope that the motives which they had used were of the best rather than the worst. Love hopes. Love waits for change. And love goes on lasting. Love perseveres. Love endures all things. It perseveres. It stands up. stays under. Now there is a connection between love believing, love hoping, and love lasting. When love really doesn't have any evidence, it still believes the best. When the evidence goes bad, then it still hopes for the best. And when hopes are continually disappointed, love still keeps on lasting. It goes on enduring. This beautiful passage on love is a model by which we're to arrange our own lives so that we're the loving people Christ has called us to be. I want to do an experiment with you as we close today. I'd like for you, if you don't have your Bible open, to reopen it to the passage we've been in. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, or 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. We have already read that scripture and referred to it. Uh, throughout our time this morning, I want us to read it twice and each time we'll read it in a different way. We'll read it together. The first time we want 
to read it together, I want for you, in place of the word love, to put the word Jesus. And in place of the pronoun it, to put the pronoun he. So that it will read, Jesus is patient, Jesus is kind. We'll read those three verses together in that way. Let's do it. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, he always trusts, he always hopes, he always perseveres. Now when you're beginning to feel like you're cast off from God and that the Lord really doesn't love you, take the scripture out and read it that way. How is it that we're so all the time feeling that the Lord doesn't love us when he tells us so explicitly how greatly is the depth of his love that he doesn't have us out on some conditional string somewhere? Now I want us to read it finally in a different way. I want us now to put the personal pronoun I in the place of love and it so that we say this of ourselves. You say, but I would be lying if I said that of myself. Well then make a faith statement. Make a faith statement. This is where I want my life to go. This is what I want it to be. This is the reality that I want God to speak into existence in my life. For this I want to describe me. Let this Word from God, describe us. For love really has no meaning unless it comes in the flesh. Love has no meaning as an abstract idea and concept or as a word. Love only has meaning when it lives in us. So we are to be as love. We are to take on the characteristics of love. Let's read it with the eye. I am patient. I am kind. I do not envy, I do not boast, I am not proud, I am not rude, I am not self-seeking, I am not easily angered, I keep no record of wrongs. I do not delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. I always protect, I always trust, I always hope, I always persevere. Shall we pray? May it be so, Lord. May it be so. And when the moments come that the enemy of our soul causes us to want to think that your love is something very flimsy, as though it were a thread hanging down with all the fibers eroded away but one small strand, help us to see the great big rope of your love which is so big nobody can even get their arms around it a love that is strong and constant and true, a love that believes and forgives and goes on serving, a love that is patient and kind. Help us, Lord, in our own life to follow in your steps, for you have called us that we might follow you, that your life might be lived out in us. Teach us, Lord, how to love. And help us as an entire community of people, as a church, to be able to read the we into this passage as well, that we are loving as your people and we are kind. Forgive us, Lord, those moments, whether in distant or recent experience, where we have ceased to be what in fact you call us to be. Help us to become, O Lord. Help us to become. We ask in your name. Amen. Thank you.